what a beautiful morning that we have here, worshiping here with one another, brothers and sisters in Christ, and being able to sing songs of praise to God. Thank Jason for the scripture he read this morning. Thank him for the comments that he made at the table. Thank David for the beautiful songs that he has led. Thank you all for being here. Jason made reference to the lesson I prepared this morning, seeing harvest through his eyes. And the text that we're going to spend a good bit of, of the, the morning is in Matthew, the ninth chapter, verses 35 through 38. I'll give you a few moments to, to turn to that. Through this passage, there, there are several things that we need to be aware of. Matthew 9, 35 through 38. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes... He was moved with compassion because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. There's a lot of wealth in this passage that we need to consider. I want to start out, though, a few years ago, there was a research group that was involved in gathering and analyzing information concerning religious beliefs of Americans since 1984. That was quite a few years ago. But many of their findings are startling and rather eye-opening. They found that 33% of Americans at this time, in 1984, believe in God but have no church affiliation whatsoever. While it found that 20% of those who have church affiliation believe that just living a good life will gain them a place in heaven. Given those two stats alone, tells us that 53% of Americans at that time are lost and on their way to hell. Because in Matthew 7, Jesus says, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now, this doesn't take in, into con account this research the people who are atheists or are, are involved in occult forms of worship. So over half of everyone you run into, you're going to find out really are lost. This is a growing population, as we can tell in our day today. More and more people every year are added to these categories. And if we were to throw all the false teachers and that teach false doctrines into the mix, it could be easily said that 75% or even greater of Americans are lost and going to hell. Which, if we stop to think about it, this could have been a close percentage that Jesus was referring to in the parable of the soils. In Luke, the 8th chapter, verses 4 and on, he talks about some of the seeds fell by the wayside, some fell on rocks, some fell among the thorns, but others fell on good ground. And I believe this is why Jesus said in this passage that the harvest truly is plenteous. There are people to reach. There is work to be done. One of the greatest dangers of the church today is that we don't see this 
as the most important work for us. Just think about that. The thousands and thousands of people that have beliefs that are not contrary to God's word. Walking among, around us in our everyday lives, do we take the time to stop and think about their lives, their soul's conditions? This is not important in our lives. Most everything else comes before the work of reaching the lost with the word of God. So as the masses of people gathered to see Jesus, and as Jesus ministered to the needs of the people all around him, he met their physical needs, but he was able to see beyond just that. Jesus was able to see the deepest needs of their hearts. He looked, them up, he looked at the multitudes around him, and he was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion for them. He saw the reality of the need of the people all around him. He saw them as they were, and he sought to share this with his disciples. Jesus wants us to see the danger of humanity as he does. He wants us to see the people as they really are. He wants us to be moved with compassion, just as he was. He wants us to be able to see the harvest through his eyes. This is the thought I want to stress with you today. I want us to see the harvest through his eyes. May the Lord help us to see the lost people around us just like Jesus saw them. In our study today, I want you to see four things that Jesus saw. He saw the pity of the harvest. As we read in Matthew, the ninth chapter, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. When Jesus looked at the lost people around him, he saw them as they really were. He was able to look beyond the outward appearance of their self-sufficiency, their self-righteousness, their self-confidence. Jesus saw the inward paths of pain, loneliness, and misery that they felt in their hearts. Jesus saw people who grew weary under the load of their sins and the unrealistic expectations which were forced upon them by the religious leaders and the burdens of the land. He saw a people who were scattered. He saw people who were wandering aimlessly through life with no direction and with no planned future destination. And most importantly, he saw people who lived life with no shepherd for their souls. He saw a people that was hopelessly lost. Oh, how we need to see the multitudes just like Jesus saw them. All around us, we see families that seem happy. They have good jobs. They have plenty of money. They have houses and all the things this world can offer them. But if we could only look into their hearts, we might see turmoil. We might see fear, loneliness, desperation, and even no hope for their souls. Have you ever heard the expression, I'd like to be a little mouse in that home? Well, most generally, that was said for the wrong reasons. But for the right reason would be to find out how, find out what was missing in their spiritual lives. Find out if they even think about God. Find out if they even study their Bibles. Many times we find that the lies of those around us is all about the present time and things of this earth. What they truly need is Jesus, and they need a Lord and shepherd. Also in our neighborhoods, we see other families that don't have much as a first group, but they do work, and they do have a place to live. And their lives are also driven by worldliness. They seem 
kind of standoffish to the gospel. They're even angered toward those who even try to tell them about Jesus. But if you could rip aside the layers of their lives and peer into their souls, you might see people who are afraid to die and even afraid to live. They're people without hope. They need someone, too, to see them as they really are. Someone who can comfort and console them with love and with God's word. Someone who could see them as they are and still love them. These kinds of comparisons could go on forever, but what Jesus really saw was the end of these people's existence. He saw where they were headed. He knew that without him, they were all doomed to perish in hell. This is what we need to see today in our friends, our families, and our neighbors. They may look like they have it all together, but if they were lost without an obedient hope of salvation, they are headed to hell, and they need to be saved by the word of God. Jesus knows their condition, yet he loves them still. Look at the lives of your friends and families and help them to see the blessings given to you through Jesus. Look at their speech and help them talk righteously. Look at their pain and help comfort them. Look at their needs and help them find the necessities. May the Lord God help us to see the harvest through his eyes. Point number two. Jesus saw the potential of the harvest. Jesus looked at the crowds around him, and he saw a plenteous harvest, as we read earlier. I am sure that all the disciples saw people, all, the, all that the disciples saw were people pushing and shoving to get close to the Savior. But Jesus saw more. He saw men who needed salvation. He saw a harvest that was ripe for the picking. He looked beyond their condition and their destination, and he saw a people that could be delivered. He saw a people that could be delivered. A people that could be changed. And a people that could be saved. He, did, he didn't see the problems, but he saw the potential. How many times do we look around and we see people that we want, don't want to be bothered with? We see people that, that they won't accept the truth. They won't have anything to, to do with God. What do we see when we look at the people around us? Do we see sinners lost in their filthiness and vileness with no hope of changing? Do we see people who are like dogs and don't care? Do we see people as they are, or do we see them as the Lord does with hope and potential? That's the view we need to observe. That's the view Jesus had of lost men. He saw them not as they were, but as they could be by the cleansing power of God. In the fourth chapter of John, Jesus stood with his disciples outside the city of the Samaritans. The Samaritans were a, a people despised by the Jews in Jesus' day. But Jesus went to a city of Samaritans and he spoke to a sinful woman as what, at the well. Now, all others considered the Samaritans not worthy of teaching, not worthy of being near, not worthy of talking to. But Jesus... saw her not just as she was. And indeed, she had lived a sinful life, as the scriptures mention, but he saw her as how she could be with the living water that he spoke of in this passage. Down in verse 27, at that point his disciples, they came and they marveled that he had talked with them, or with a Samaritan woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek? 
Why are you talking with her? But later in verses 34 through 38, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me. His will was to do the will of his Father who sent him and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this saying is for if in this the saying is true, one sows another one reaps. I sent you to reap that which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. But then again in later, in the later verse 39 through 42, he goes on to say, many of the Samaritans of this city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified to her friends and the family. Remember the story. She listened to Jesus, and then she went to tell her friends and family. And she testified to her friends and family, he told me all that I ever did, he as being Jesus. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe. Not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Brethren, there are people all around us who need Jesus, the Savior. The harvest is truly plentiful. Many are ripe for the picking. We just need to see it and go into the fields as Jesus did. You may ask, where are the fields of harvest? Well, they're your next door neighbors. They're your, your friends, your family, your fellow workers, and even your new acquaintances. May the Lord help us to see the potential harvest through his eyes. The next point, Jesus saw the problem of the harvest. He pointed out that there was plenty to harvest. But there's a problem. As Jesus looked at the harvest, he acknowledged the fact that it was plentiful and that it was pitiful. But as he saw lost men all around, he recognized that were, there were only a few laborers working in the Father's field. Does this present a problem today? Reaping the harvest of souls is hard work, and few, it seems, are willing to roll up their sleeves and get involved in the work. Matthew, the fourth chapter, and 18 through 22, Jesus called his men to follow him, promising to make them fishers of men. Have you ever wondered why Jesus chose fishermen to do his work? Fishermen, they set out their lines, they set out their nets day in and day out, not knowing that they're even going to catch fish. But they set them out anyway. That's why Jesus chose fishermen. That makes sense? You don't know whether person you're talking to is going to become a Christian or going to believe in God, but should that stop you from planting the seed? Should that stop you from watering the seed? Those of you who have ever farmed or planted a garden know that the harvest doesn't just gather itself. You've got to get out there. Get down where it is and do the dirty work of harvesting it. Wouldn't it be nice if the green beans picked themselves and piled themselves on the porch for you just to 
sit there and relax and string them? Or the tomatoes fall off the vine and roll into the kitchen sink? It doesn't work that way. To harvest your garden, you have to go to where the harvest is. The same is true in bringing men and women to Christ. Haggai, the second chapter of verse 19, he asked a very important question. He asked it in a way that chastised the priests when he says, Is the seed still in the barn? Which indicated that if the seed is not sown, don't expect a harvest. What good is the seed in the barn? It's not going to grow. Sowing the seed is not easy work. Jesus didn't say it would be, but it must be done if we expect a harvest to be gathered. May God help us to see that the laborers are few, and he needs us to go into that field to harvest. The last point, Jesus saw the power of the harvest. As Jesus spoke about the harvest and the needs associated with, he told his disciples what to do first. He said in verse 38 of Remain Passage, to pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers into the harvest. Do we pray? Do we pray for God to send us into the harvest? If we don't, is there something wrong with our prayers? Is there something wrong with our hearts, not willing to plant the seed? Are we satisfied for the seed to be left in the barn? God places all mankind before our eyes. He puts people all around us, giving us the opportunities to plant the seed. Then we must water the seed of the word that is planted, and then we must see that the light of Christ is constantly shining upon those lost hearts of mankind where the seed was planted. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, verses 6 through 9, he says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase, so then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You may be asking another question. Where's the increase? And we wonder sometimes, why isn't this building full? Why aren't our numbers increasing? Have we planted? Have we watered? We must develop a longing desire to save the lost and begin praying for them as we should. Souls will be saved, and with the Lord's help, we will develop a deep compassion within us for them, within our own hearts, so that we will continue harvesting more souls. Can we see the need this day to pray? If we can, the starting place is to get before God in prayer and truly ask him to strengthen our weaknesses so that we can go into the field and that we can begin working and gathering the harvest. Isaiah said in Isaiah 6, 5 through 9, he suddenly he realized in a dream that he was a sinful man. He was sinful in his duties to the Lord, and he asked why, he asked by the, he was asked by the Lord, whom shall I send? And who will go with us? The Lord asked Isaiah that. And Isaiah concluded in verse 8 by saying, 
here am I, send me. Looking through the eyes of Jesus helps us find the fields of harvest and helps us see the potential that is ever so present. Looking through the eyes of Jesus will help us prepare to be a worker for the Lord. Looking through the eyes of Jesus will help us devote the needed time to pray that the Lord will send us out into the fields and find the harvest. Today the Lord is asking you, whom shall I send and who will go with us? What will, you, what will be your reply? Think on these things while together we stand and sing.